to worship here at Front Royal Presbyterian. We're glad that you've joined us today on our virtual service. I'm coming to you from the parlor today, partially because I my voice, I'm not sure it'll carry through the sanctuary, but also because it's so beautiful in here and we have renovated so many places in the church. You gotta come by and see. I do not have COVID. I was tested, but I am struggling with my voice, as you can probably tell, which probably is good. It means it's a shorter sermon. <laughs> and to that, the kids said hooray. Um, we do have a congregational meeting today on November 7th. You'll be receiving an email from the church explaining what was discussed and what decisions were made because we're aware that not everybody can attend in person. So, my friends, as we join our hearts together, let us worship the Lord our God. time of wonder and music that calls us home. Welcome to hear God's words that inspire and challenge and to reminders that we are offered to holy hospitality. Hospitality that teaches us how to open our lives to others, leading us to fully live open minds, open hearts, and open doors. Amen. Prayer of Confession. Merciful God, you know how we love miracles. We love your healing and life-giving presence. We confess that poverty and oppression are less appealing topics, yet we find you among the poor, the downtrodden, the widow, the orphan. In your midst, we find you, your prophets and your miracles. Dwell with us as we make the struggles of the oppressed our own struggles. Join us at the table as we join the effort to feed and clothe those who live in want. Grant us your compassion, we pray, that we may truly be your people. It is God that always provides, no matter what, when, or where, or even if we question. And it begins in our birth as the children of God, in the waters of baptism, where we are reminded that we are adopted into the family of God, forgiven of our sins, and told to go out and forgive others. My friends, know that you are forgiven and be at peace.
story, Elijah. So part of God's story is about a guy named Elijah, and it goes like this. Elijah's job was to talk to God and tell God's special family, the Israelites, what God said. So he was called a prophet. Unfortunately, the rulers of Israel were King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. They were the most wicked leaders Israel had ever had, and they didn't care what God had to say. They made Elijah's job really hard, but just wait until you see what God did for him. See, Ahab and Jezebel worshiped Baal instead of God. Baal was a false god, an idol. Kids, an idol is anything that gets the attention we should be giving God. Money, stuff, or even people can be idols. And when Ahab and Jezebel worship Baal, they turn a lot of God's family away from God too. But here's the thing, God wants all of our worship and love, and he totally deserves it. So God sent Elijah to tell Ahab and Jezebel that it wasn't gonna rain for a while. There wouldn't even be dew. That means crops wouldn't grow. So the Israelites would run out of food. Then they would think Baal was angry, and they'd blame Ahab. When the king heard Elijah's message, he was furious. He wanted to kill Elijah. So God told Elijah to go hide in the wilderness. And just like he had said, there was no rain. In fact, for three more years, it was dry. But Ahab and Jezebel kept right on worshiping Baal and asking him for rain. Of course, that didn't work. So they stayed mad at Elijah too. They actually killed as many of God's prophets as they could find. But all that time, God kept Elijah safe. And Elijah kept telling people to believe in the real God. A few did. Like a widow who saw God do miracles through Elijah. But most kept worshiping Baal with Ahab and Jezebel. Finally, in the third year of drought, God told Elijah to go talk to Ahab again. This time, Elijah challenged the king to a contest that would show who was real, Baal or God. Ahab brought 450 prophets of Baal to meet Elijah at a place called Mount Carmel. They built an altar to worship Baal, and Elijah built an altar to worship God. They both prayed for fire and then waited to see whose God brought it first. And since Baal was a false god, you can probably guess who won. Yep, God. In fact, he sent so much fire, it burned up Elijah's altar and everything around it. After that, Elijah prayed for rain, and God sent it. It seems like maybe Ahab and Jezebel would follow God after that, right? But they only got more angry. Jezebel sent Elijah a message that she was gonna kill him, so Elijah ran away again. This time because he was scared. Even though God had kept him safe for years, he wanted to quit being a prophet. He didn't think anybody listened to him anyway. He laid under a tree and said, I've had enough, Lord. Then he went to sleep. God must have understood how Elijah felt because guess what he did? First, he sent an angel to cook Elijah some bread. Then God let Elijah see him. Elijah had talked to God a lot, but he'd never seen him. While Elijah was waiting for God, he saw a windstorm, then an earthquake, then a fire pass him by. But God wasn't in any of those. Then he heard a gentle whisper. There was God. Elijah had spent his life obeying God, even though people wanted to kill him for it. But guess what? Ahab and Jezebel never could kill Elijah. Actually, Elijah didn't die, not even of old age. Instead, God sent a chariot of fire, and Elijah rode it right up to heaven. We don't know exactly how that happened, but it did. God didn't make Elijah's job easier, but he did take care of him. And in the end, Elijah got to be with his God, the real God, in heaven. And that's the story of Elijah. So in case you missed it, here's the quick version. Elijah was a prophet. Ahab and Jezebel worshiped idols. Elijah gave them messages from God. They got mad. God told Elijah to run away. Elijah proved God is real. Jezebel got mad. Elijah ran away. He wanted to quit. God was gentle with him. Ahab and Jezebel couldn't kill Elijah. God took Elijah to heaven in a chariot of fire. And that's part of God's story.
call to offering. As we collect offerings quite differently now, we still seek to honor God in all that we do and remember that it is more blessed to give than to receive. You may give online at tithely.com or send a check to the church. And as we prepare our budget this year to come, please watch your email for further information and ways in which you can continue to do the work of Christ with us here at Front Royal Presbyterian Church. Let us pray. Lord, sometimes we, we fail to remember that we are blessed beyond anything we can imagine, that it is you that feeds us each and every day. It is you that supplies each and all of our needs. So Lord, receive now what we have to offer. Use it to your glory alone. Amen. Hebrews 9, 24 through 28, from the New International Version. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But as he appeared once for all of the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him.
Let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. You are the God of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Rebecca and Rachel and Leah. You are the God that from the beginning of time supplied us with everything that we could possibly need. From the air that we breathe to the dirt in which we put our hands and bring forth vegetation to friends and family that gather around us when we are grieving and lost, to strangers that we meet on the street that bring us a little bit of your joy. You, O oh Lord, have given us life. Your breath soars through each one of our bodies. And Lord, though we try to steal it back, you continue to give. And that breath which is within us is your spirit. It makes us alive in your word and in the world in which we live. It allows us to do things that seemingly were impossible, like helping a stranger, feeding the hungry, housing the homeless, welcoming the stranger. And so Lord, as we step out in faith and, and take that tentative step towards giving parts of ourselves that we're, we're not sure that we want to give, Give us the faith of that widow in Zarephath. Give us strangers like Elijah along our path so that we might know and see that you are a God that always provides. Forgive us when we demand our own way. Forgive us for thinking we know best what we need. Forgive us for throwing our fists in our air and yelling at you because you don't give us what we want but instead you supply us with everything we need. Help us to understand the difference. Oftentimes we're like petulant little children thinking we need the M&Ms. We need the coolest toys at Christmas. When in fact, we don't, we get confused. Clarify our minds, Lord so that we might not live as independent beings, but as the family of God. So that we might not score away things for us for later, but that we might open our pantries and hearts wide and share with those that are in need. And so Lord, in this time today, we pray for our nation. We pray that after the election, as we look at new people in charge in our governments, that you might give them wisdom. That you, O oh Lord, might be with our nation as we welcome refugees from Afghanistan. May your prayers and blessings be all over Massanetta Springs as we as a Presbyterian church care for a hundred homeless, lost, and broken families from Afghanistan. Lord, be with us as we continue to battle, battle COVID and somehow give us wisdom to work together to find answers so that we might live as we did, hugging people when we see family, looking forward to holidays like Thanksgiving and Christmas, and finally just holding hands at a table with all your loved ones. Lord, we know that in your mercy you look down on us and give us grace, and we oftentimes lose that sight of it. So speak to us again through your word, through your truth, through your people, through your son, in whose name we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So as we 
turn to scripture today. We're going to pick up in Kings, first Kings in the Old Testament. And at this time, we've got King Ahab, who was a bad king. King David's long gone, he's dead, been gone for a while. King Ahab believes in the god of Baal and other gods. And in the previous chapters, we were, saw how Yahweh and Baal were pitted against each other. And Yahweh made mincemeat of Baal. And as a result, there's a drought, a famine of three years. And so this is where we're picking up in 1 Kings chapter 17. Now Elijah, the Tishite of Tishi in Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him. Depart from here, turn eastward, and hide yourself in the brook of Chedeth, that is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and dwelt by the brook that is to the east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him and said, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Selim, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a crows. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in, prepare it for myself and for my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah says to her, Fear not. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterward make for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord your God of Israel, The jar of meal shall not be ate spent, and the cruse of oil shall not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of the meal was not spent, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoke by Elijah. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill, and his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to bring me my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my own son. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her bosom and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged, laid him out on his own bed, and he cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, hast thou brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's soul come into him again. And then the Lord hearkened to the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth is the truth. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of our Lord will stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. Lord, we know that you ask more of us than we are often willing to give. And oftentimes it just means that we have to listen a little closer. So, Lord, might you use the words to bring about your glory. Help me to get out of the way so that you might be glorified in all that we do. Amen. Every minister has a few texts that terrify them. We all have them, and, and when we read them, they kind of get at us. And I have three in general. The first of which is, I have a really hard time in Scripture when God sanctions violence. I've always struggled intensely with the Israelites being told to, to kill the entire enemy. Not just those that had swords in their hands, but the elderly and the young, the feeble, the old, the lost, the broken, the sheep. Decimate them all. How can a God be like that? Another one that we all struggle with, and of course it's stewardship season, is when God asks something of us that we don't want to give. I get offended when God wants to separate me from my stuff. Because it's my stuff and I've worked hard for it. And well, God, you know, I just, I don't think that's right. And thirdly, <coughs> I have a problem sometimes with texts that shun those that are not ready, like the bridesmaids. Those that, that put people outside of the covenant that says, God says, these are my chosen people and this is it. Because I know I cannot earn that chosenness. So I have those three texts of terror. And this one, this text this morning, focuses on two of them. And it's scary. And the reason those are scary to me, especially the final two, or because they expose my vulnerability. They expose a part of me that I'm not ready to let go of in order for God to be. That jar on her shelf that sat there. What's in your jar? I want you to think about that through the whole sermon. Just picture a jar on a shelf in your home that you don't dare touch, you don't dare take down. It is sacred. It is never to be used. It's your safety net. I love Dr. Pepper. We all know that. We all know it's the drink of God. It's wonderful stuff. But in my house, we've always had a rule you can't claim food. So if Isabel and I were to go to the grocery store and buy Pop-Tarts, she then cannot write her name on them and say, no, Jacob, only Isabel's Pop-Tarts. No claiming food. Which means that I'm not... I also cannot claim Dr. Pepper. But I found my way around it. I just, you know, put the communal Dr. Pepper in the fridge and I hide a couple in the cabinet. And then I have a two liter hidden, not telling you where. And then in case the backup, backup one doesn't work, I've got one can left. You see, we always have a backup plan because we're never really ready to give it up. We always have to have something there because we're not sure. We're not sure we trust the world around us to supply all of our needs. So if Elijah came to my door, knock, knock, knock. I'm really thirsty, Pastor Carrie. Can I have one of your Dr. Peppers? And I have two left. I'm probably going to speak through the door saying, truly, I don't have a clue who you are and I don't even let my kids have it. So... Go, go next door. Because let's be honest. What's in your jar? What are you not willing to share? Just imagine Elijah. All of this drought is his fault. He brought it upon them. <coughs> he told King Ahab, no dew will fall on the ground until I say so. It's his fault. And then, and then he gets to go to the stream and he's fed by ravens. I mean, that's just pretty cool. He's fed by ravens, ravens day and night. And then God tells him, you go to the town of Zarephath and there's going to be a widow there and she's going to take care of you. After being fed by ravens, 
and having been a, a prophet that's been wandering, I'm sure Elijah's first thought was, yes, finally, a rich widow in a great house, a banquet of food, all the wine I can drink. Thank you, God, finally, my prayers are answered. So when he gets to the gates of Zarephath <coughs> and sees the widow gathering just a few meager st sticks, <laughs> I can't help but think he was disappointed. And it reminds me that God works in different ways than we expect. God, give me a sign. And we expect pomp and circumstance. We expect thunderstorms and lightning. And instead, it comes in a silent whisper in the middle of the night. God, come. Come to us like you did. Break down from heaven. Come break into this world like you did through Jesus Christ. Because we will see you. We will know you. But instead, what we get are just a few sticks. And a widow and her son in their final days. And as I mentioned, there's always the rest of the story. And the rest of the story gets us to this point, as I said, with King Ahab. And the drought is Elijah's fault. It is on Elijah's back. He put the curse on the land. So when he meets this woman in Zarephath, there are a couple things I want you to note. Zarephath was a city in Zidon, which is now near modern-day Lebanon. It is not within the covenant, which means that the widow is not a part of the covenant promise, which means that she does not know Elijah's God, which means that she is not one of the children of the promise. She is not an Israelite. In many ways, she is the opposite of the Israelite. So when Elijah comes knocking on her door, this widow is poor and lonely and a stranger in a foreign land. And if I were her, I'd tell Elijah to keep on walking. Elijah and the widow were strangers in every sense of the word. And that is important because like I jest with my Dr. Pepper that I won't share it with my kids and sometimes some of you I might, some of you I may not, I don't know. They didn't know each other at all. How likely are we to take that jar down and share it with a stranger with a different faith and different ethnicity and different gods? You, you think you're willing to do that because we are called in this day, in this time, in this hour, today and every day to do that and we do not. Massanetta is housing refugees. Do we go and spend hours cooking and feeding? No, because we put our time in that sacred jar. We'll put our prayers out there, but not quite sure what else we can give. They're different than us. And they're not part of our promise. Sometimes God's word comes surprisingly dangerously close, doesn't it? And it shocks me to hear Elijah speaking in this passage. Because <laughs> when I read it, I want to add in some manners. He doesn't sound so polite. It almost sounds like he says, hey, you, woman, over there, bring me some water. Couldn't he have said, hi, my name's Elijah. Would you, would you mind giving me just a cool cup of water? I, I don't have a cup. Would you mind sharing a morsel of your bread with me? But no, he demands water and then he demands bread. And he doesn't give an explanation. All he says is, don't worry. There'll be enough until the, they'll, they'll keep, keep it going until the dew falls on the earth, until the rain falls and the drought's over. And this widow does not know Elijah's God. So the one promise that he gives, she has no reason to believe whatsoever. And a lot of people will compare this passage with the widow's might in the New Testament. And in the widow's might, yes, the widow gave all that she had. But it is very important to note that this widow does not give all that she has. She first feeds Elijah, and then she feeds her and her son. 
And I don't know what was going through her mind. Because when I get close to my last Dr. Peppers, I start getting a little thirsty. I don't know how it must have felt to reach into that jar the next day and still pull some meal and grain out of it when you expect nothing. I, I don't know, but I should know. Because like you, we pray every day. Give us today our daily bread. But no, often we should be praying. Lord, help us to survive, to know, to have the faith that is to live on just my daily bread and not the stores of savings that I put to the side. How different would we be? How different would we be in this world is if, if that life rolled off our tongue as easily as the words do? Because the widow, she stutters once by saying, I am just going to go die. But then <laughs> she invites Elijah home and for many days they ate. What is in your jar? I really want you to think about that. And it's different for everybody. I'll be honest, and no, no joking now, I'm in my jar in my family. I, the text of terror where Abraham is asked to sacrifice Isaac, that is beyond me. I do not have the faith to sacrifice a child, and I am willing to accept that. My family's in that jar, and I'm going to protect them at all costs. Your finances are probably in that jar. For many people, your health is in that jar, and that's okay. Here we are during COVID. For some people, it's their personal time. For some people, it's space in their heart that they won't open up. What is in your jar? Because strangely enough, the promise is that it will never run dry. Elijah is a man of power, and that's what this story can often tell us. It speaks to us that Elijah has the power that he was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, prophet of the Old Testament, second only to Abraham. Maybe that's why this story is passed on and on and on. And it's actually even told by different prophets as if the experience were their own. Elisha has a very similar story. This story tells us not only that Elijah is powerful, but it also says sometimes things don't go as you expect. Because after they eat, and they've eaten, eaten for many days, the boy falls ill. And there it's as if there was no breath in him, which is a poetic way of saying he has died. And the widow, like all of us, immediately blames herself. If only I had, if I had done this, and no doubt in her mind was, what sin have I done that has brought this calamity upon my child? And then, like, just like us, she blames Elijah. You brought this. You, you pure and innocent self walked into my house and you showed my filth and my sin and how broken and wrong I am. You brought this calamity upon me and my son. And we've talked about that. And that's a place of deep loss. <laughs> the thing is, is that she struggles with it. And that's okay. She yells about it. And that's okay. Because when Elijah goes upstairs with the boy and lays him on the bed, he too yells at God. Elijah yells at God, why have you done this? Why have you done this to this child, to this family? God, are you even paying attention? And we love to raise our fists at God and demand our way. And some of us may feel guilty, but I tell you, God can take it. You yell at God all you want. God can take it. But the terrifying part is you still have to accept his answer, even if it's not what you want. Like I said in the prayer, we are petulant children. 
We do not know the difference between needs and wants. So after he throws him on the bed and prays three times over him, the boy's breath is restored to him. The boy's breath is restored to him and is brought back to life. Why in the world did this text have to be so difficult? It's just a woman and her son struggling to make it day by day. Sadly, it's the story of many mothers and children around the world and even right here in Front Royal today. And I would do you wrong if like the evangelists and some other preachers love to use this text and say, give it all to God and he'll take care of you. Put all of your savings in the offering plate. God will provide you tenfold because that is not what scripture says. Scripture says he will supply our daily needs. And that's what this is. Our daily needs. I cannot promise you wealth and health and happiness. This story has a happy ending and for that I am grateful. But not all of them do. How do you go past when God answers no. There's a couple things we've learned in the scripture. The first of which is, answers my third text of terror, which is God passing judgment on people that are not in his circle. In the beginning of the text, the widow says, your God, to Elijah. At the end, she says, my God. God works in mysterious ways. How? <laughs> and it's the age-old question. How do we find peace when God asks us to separate from something that we love, something that we cherish? How do we find peace with that? And I'll let you know when I find it. But for today, I just keep trying to pray those words, instill them in me. Give us this day our daily bread. And in that, I give thanks. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Go. Enjoy the day. Be with family. Show strangers the love of Christ. Above all else, know that you are loved. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Shalom, shalom, shalom.